Hebrews chapter 11, please. <coughs> the last person we left off was Moses. And there are a few things regarding Moses that I want to cover, actually. A few more things regarding Moses that I want to cover. Now, remember, we're covering the choice of suffering versus pleasure. As a believer and as a Christian, a Christian must make a choice. A Christian makes the choice of suffering or pleasure. What will he choose? Question to you now is, what will you choose? What choice will you make? As he makes the choice, the underlying ingredient through all of this that one cannot forget is faith. It is the underlying ingredient. Without faith, that's why you cannot make the choice. So remember, faith is always in this. When you choose pleasure, I know why. You don't believe. That's the simple answer. You don't have faith in what God does with your life. Think about it. What makes you a real Bible believer? You believe that book, and you believe it's real. So if that faith is so strong into right doctrine and truth, then it doesn't matter how alluring the world is or how great your pain is, you're going to hold on to it with everything that you've got and still make the choice of doing what's right, even though there's suffering involved above pleasure. That's right, and Hebrews 11, <coughs> verse 25 through 27, that's what we left off last time. And we gave the comparisons where Moses was able to endure and was able to put up with the wrath of the king, put up with suffering, because he kept looking at the prize. Now, you're going to notice right here that the Christian makes the choice on suffering, and the reason why he will make this choice on suffering is due to the prize. So that you have to keep your eye on the prize. What are you looking at? You have to keep looking at the prize, keep looking at the reward up in heaven. And because of that, that's the reason why you're able to endure. So you're able to go through it as long as you keep looking at the prize. So see right here, you're able to make the choice of suffering because you're enduring as you keep looking at the prize. What's all your focus on? If you keep looking at suffering, if you keep looking at the pleasures of the world, then your eyes are definitely not looking at the prize, right? When your eye is not looking at the prize, there's no wonder why your faith falters, and then you backslide or you choose the world altogether. Another thing that is helpful in Moses' case is not to only just keep looking at the prize, which is why you're able to keep enduring, enduring, enduring. Remember that last line, seeing him who is invisible. We covered that. So no matter what, through the eyes of faith, you can see that prize. Whereas the world and suffering, you're blinding yourself to that. So that's what keeps you going, is through the eye of faith. So faith, again, is the underlying ingredient. So that's one. The second thing that will help you, so we saw the first tip is faith. The second tip is the next verse, uh, is within this passage, excuse me. Go back in verse 25. Then to enjoy the pleasures of sin for what? Season, Season is uh, the very important thing. So when you're looking at the prize, here's another thing you need to carefully look at. You need to look at the temporary, the, tempo, the temporary period of pleasure. Now, the thing is, you don't see it as temporary. You see it as something that you can enjoy for life, right? Now, if, if there's one thing that your sinful flesh, your stubborn flesh has learned, is that once you get the thing that you want, it doesn't last forever. 
and then you're looking for the next one. Yes, then, once you gratify yourself, you're looking for the next one. Come on. Then, when you're looking for the other one, then, you, then you're looking for the next one, next one. See, it's, it's only temporary. Right. So the thing is, what good is it if you keep saying, uh, Lord, uh, I want to avoid this problem, and Lord, I want you to answer this prayer request of mine where I can have this pleasurable thing in my life. I know it's worldly. It may not really be your will, but will you please give it to me? then what? Then I will be happy forever and I will never ask you again? No. Come, on. Come on. See, so what good is it if God answered that prayer? What good is it if God made you dodge that suffering? You think you're going to run away from suffering forever? You think you're going to enjoy what you want forever? See, it's better to realize to go through the temporary thing. Let the temporary thing happen and let it come and let it go. That's the thing. Because the thing that you want to be looking at is if you want something permanent, if you want something that will last for eternity, it's the prize up in heaven, obviously. Amen. So you've constantly got to look at, hey, my real reward is in heaven. That's what I want God to answer my request on. My real reward is in heaven. That's the emphasis, not in the world. Why? The world is temporary. You fulfill one, then you look for another. Now, there, here's another thing that is encouraging. Not only pleasure is temporary, get this now, that must mean then this is temporary. Doesn't that make sense? Lord, get me out of this problem. No, you don't want that. You want it to come and go. Why? The reason why is, if, you want, if God makes you avoid that suffering, like I told you before, you're not going to run away from suffering forever. <coughs> suffering is inevitable. It will happen to you one way or the other. It's better that you learn how to endure suffering and then let those things come and go that way, when the next one hits you, it doesn't hit you as hard. People who tend to run away from problems will always try to run away from something that they can't run away from. So can you imagine the stress is even greater on that? But the stress is much more light by just knowing what it's like, feeling what it's like, gaining experience in what it's like. So once the flesh learns that feeling, learns from that experience, what happens? The Bible says tribulation, work with patience, patience, experience, and experience what? Hope. See that? A better feeling comes out of suffering. Not a worse feeling. Worse feeling is if you avoid suffering. Now, did that make any sense to you or was that confusing? That makes perfect sense. So when pro I know that uh, problems happen. I'm not telling you that whenever problems happen, we're supposed to be thrilled to joy about it. We're supposed to feel good. No one feels good. But the thing is, it shouldn't feel that bad if you're so used to enduring it. The person who works out at the gym, I mean, he, he's going to have to bet on his life that his muscles are going to hurt like crazy if he, never, if he kept running away from the pain all that time after working out. But a person who's so used to enduring that, see, putting up with that, going through that over and over and over and over, not running away from it, it becomes a part of his life, and it doesn't hurt as much, and not only that, makes him stronger. It benefits him. Amen. So remember that healthy cycle that I told you. The healthy cycle uh, within our walk of faith this faith has a cycle of going through tribulation, right? So don't run away, you accept. And after that, it goes through patience, remember that? So there's your endurance. What does patient mean? Put up with something. What does endure mean? Put up with something. Then it goes through the next cycle with experience. Once your flesh gains that experience, senses that, experiences it, then experience, the Bible says, hope, right? Which is another word for faith, you might recall. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 
And then remember, like I taught you before, it becomes, uh, it becomes a circle. It doesn't end there. Thank God that what happens is now with a stronger faith, this stronger faith can put up with a stronger tribulation. And then it builds up a stronger endurance and a stronger experience, then a stronger faith. Then this other next level of stronger faith is able to put up with the next stronger tribulation. So remember, you need a strong faith to put up with the tribulation. If you don't have one, you need to start somewhere in your faith. Amen. Whether small or little, I don't care. You need to start somewhere. And then that faith, whether little or wherever you're starting, needs to get down here. Okay? Rather than running away. Running away means then you don't have faith. See? So you need to have faith and get over here and then get over here. That way you can have a stronger faith eventually. And with a very strong faith, when you go through that same tribulation, it doesn't hurt as much, believe it or not. It, it hardly bothers you. You can get a good night's sleep. You know, uh, people come and go in church and that bothered me a lot, but now it's something where I just take it as a matter of fact now. There are things that I don't want to counsel people on, problems that I don't want to take care of. And then I would used to be, go through sleepless night and go, oh man, how to handle this. But I realized I was just being overdramatic about it. <laughs> the reason why is my flesh never experienced that. Now I'm so used to that, it's just, uh, I don't mean to say that I'm heartless, but it's pretty much bread and butter now. So it's just something that I just have to do with as a leader, which makes me more effective to handle problems in the church. So I used to uh, have trouble managing counseling people. It was such a pain in the neck, and then it would drain me out mentally. If you think that a person going through his or her uh, struggles in life is hard enough, imagine you take five of them because you talk to five different people, and then you got your own to put up with. See, you think you can put up with that? I can because of the tribulation God has put me through, and then I put my faith into it, and then the experience, and now it's like clockwork. See that? It's like clockwork now. I just go to the next one, the next one. Not a problem anymore. You talk to uh, these uh, great Bible-believing pastors. I mean, I can't picture Dr. David Peacock, how many people he counseled. Not just people, but pastors he counseled. So here are pastors counseling their members, and then he's counseling those people who are counseling those people. What in the world, man? But it's like clockwork to him. You can tell. He's very experienced, professional. So the key is, why? Because you need to enter this. You need to enter this. That's extremely important. So that's why, going back over here, the first tip we realized is this faith where you have endurance and constantly looking at the prize. But the second thing is to see the temporal level, the temporal moment, the temporal span of suffering and pleasure. If you constantly look at that as well, see that? If you constantly look at how temporary it is. And if you look at how eternal that thing is, see, it will help you, just like Moses, where you can make the choice on this one rather than this. Why? Why can you make the choice on this one rather than this? Because it's simple. It's temporary. So why not? I mean, because I'm going to get the real thing up there, and that's the eternal thing. But me missing out on this and me gaining temporary ain't worth it. By the way, here's another thing to understand about under realizing the, tempor uh, the temporal span of sin and pleasure. The consequence is permanent. See, so if you don't want to suffer for the Lord then the question is, do you want to suffer for sin? See, pleasure doesn't mean that uh, it, you live happily ever after. One, it's temporary, but two, it gives you a permanent pain, permanent scar. That's for life, and then you can't take it back. So Dr. Uckman has several verses right here, which is pretty good. Uh, let's first go to Proverbs chapter 23, Proverbs 23. 
You want to know how pleasurable sin is? Read the book of Proverbs, all right? That's a great book. That will scare you from sin. Solomon tried to do that when he wrote the book of Proverbs, but apparently his son didn't get the memo. Go to Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 32. <clears throat> Proverbs 23, 20, uh, 32. At the last, see that? It biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. See, sin doesn't uh, bring you pain. All right, let me repeat that again. Sin doesn't bring you pain. It does bring you pleasure, but it begins with pleasure and it ends in pain. And when it ends in pain, that means it ends there. It's stuck there. The end. Your life does not continue. Do you understand that? Do you think there's an end to the consequence of your sin? You know what the distorted thinking is? You think that your suffering is never ending, but you think that the consequence of sin can end for you. You wonder why people mess up in the world, right? That's why people keep messing up in the world. You have to look how temporary the suffering for the Lord is and pleasure in the world is, but you also need to see the permanence of the pain. So pleasure doesn't escape the suffering. Pleasure has the suffering at the end. Pleasure has a consequence at the end right here. This suffering is permanent. All right, the next one is the book of Proverbs again. And then Dr. Upman writes out chapter uh, 14, verse 12. Chapter 14 and verse 12. 14, verse 12. So right now, the way you're going may seem all right to you. All right, it seems all right. You're doing okay. Your job's doing fine. You're your sin is uh, treating you well, it feels great, it looks great, it tastes great, and you know, your worldly friends, you know, they're, the, they're your best friends in the world, you know, you've been having a lot of fun, you got everything going for your family, but notice right here that the Bible says that Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, so it's right, but the end, see, it's always the end. The end is what? Thereof are the ways of death. All right. Uh, the next one, go to the book of Proverbs again. Proverbs is a good place to scare you away from sin. Amen. You need to get scared away from sin. Go to chapter 7. Chapter 7. Solomon knew that well. You might wonder why, because he did all that. So then he realized that the end ain't worth it. Proverbs seven twenty seven. Notice when you yield to... Uh, the sin right here, her lust, Proverbs 7, 27. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Here's another one, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 8. Ecclesiastes 8. So, fresh review. Tip number one, look at the permanence of the prize. Tip number two, Look at the temporary span of suffering and worldly pleasure. Tip number three, look at the permanence of sinful pleasure. Look at the permanence of sinful pleasure. All right. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, we'll look at verse 11. <coughs> because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully what? Mm -hmm. Said in them to do evil. Now, that's a very good verse there. Good. Amen. You know what that verse is basically saying? You're not paying for the price of sin now. That's why you're doing it. Yep, that's, good. that's a plain English for that one. Yeah. Because you're not getting punished for it. That's why you're doing it. Yeah, fully set. Wow. That's why you're fully set to do the evil because uh, the... The sentence, see, the punishment against your evil work is not processed immediately. Why? Because you have to enjoy the pleasure. Why, why would sin have to be pleasurable? Because it has to trick you. It ain't going to trick you if you're going to feel bad. The only way sin's going to trick you is to make you feel good. So sin makes you feel good. Then at the end, bam, it hits you hard. 
And guess what? You can cry and whine and moan all you want, but you ain't getting out of that. You should have cried and moaned and gotten scared at the beginning rather than the end. You want mercy? I'll tell you what, I want mercy. You want mercy? You want mercy? You want mercy? Then do it before the end. Yeah. All right, just get right with God. You're doing the right thing. Constantly check yourself. I hope you've been doing that. You remember that teaching on backsliding? When's the last time you confessed your sin? Okay, if you haven't been, start catching up. So every day, you, you got to reflect yourself what you did wrong and repent and plead the blood. If you don't, you wonder why some of the things that you're going through, some of the sufferings you're going through, you're stuck in it. All right. Okay, that was hard. Let's go back to Hebrews 11. That's as pointed as I will get, okay? So don't worry. That has, that's as pointed as I will get. But uh, this must be kicked. Sin must be kicked. That way you don't end up in this mess, okay? That way you don't end up in this mess. So three tips here that I hope you wrote down, okay? Three tips you were given. Now don't blow it, all right? Don't ruin it. Don't forget it, okay? You got it this time, okay? You got three tips here. What are the three tips? Let me remind you again, just in case, okay? That way you don't rot, okay? First tip, look at the permanence of the prize in heaven, okay? Look at that. Look, looking at that requires endurance, okay? Seeing the invisible through eyes of faith and blinding the visibility of the worldly pleasure, okay? Second tip, <coughs> look at the temporary span. Look at how temporary pleasure is, including the suffering, including the suffering. When you're feeling that pain, you got to realize this. There's an end to this. See, that's all you have to do when you're gritting your teeth in pain. There's going to be an end to this. All right? And when you're enjoying with a smile the pleasure of sin, smile big and say, there's an end to this, which is death. So start doing that too. All right? Now you're going to hate me now when you do your sin, right? You're going to remember that. The third tip is to remember the permanence of the suffering of worldly pleasure. Remember the permanence, look at the permanence of the suffering of worldly pleasure. Okay, you want me to end it? I end it, we're done, all right? Now it's gonna rot in your conscience for eternity. You're welcome. Okay, now let's go to the next verse. Verse 28. <coughs> Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Okay, another example of Moses' faith. We, the author of Hebrews is demonstrating that he kept the Passover and then observed the sprinkling of blood on the doorpost. Why? Because he had faith. He believed that the one who would destroy all the firstborn babies in Egypt, that he was going to destroy them. And he didn't want that destroyer to touch them, to put his hands on him or the people in his house. So that's why he put the blood on the doorposts. Now, some of you know that story, right? You also notice my explanation. The reason why it's a little bit wordy is because I'm trying to match word for word with that verse. Yeah. So you'll notice that. Mm -hmm. why, why, why I'm doing that is because you keep hearing the complaint from people the Bible's too hard to understand, but what you're going to find out, it's not. It's not. Amen. Because you're going to catch yourself where I'm explaining the verse, and the unconscious mind is going to go, I already know that, I already know that, I already know that. Come on. That's what's going to happen, which is a good thing. That means it's working. Okay? So you need to convince your unconscious mind that that book is easy to understand, that it ain't hard. Also, there might be some areas you have difficulty understanding which is why you need to hear very carefully how I'm explaining the verse. And the other thing, which is my favorite line, is I might be lying to you. So look at the verse. Don't just watch me online and go, wow, wow, that clicks, that makes sense. No, there are plenty of preachers who Come can on. talk like me. Come on. Make it sound logical, political, emotional, and then meets all the right levels, triggers all the right buttons. You know what's going to make all the difference? You look at that verse and test me out. All right, you need something empirical, you need something scientific, real, that you can see for yourself, and the closest you're going to get to that, that God's going to give to you is the Bible. Amen. 
Would you believe that? Yeah. So you need to test it, okay? Scientific empiricism, like the atheist boasts, right? You want that? Then look at the verse. Look at the Bible, all right? See if I'm lying to you or not, all right? All right, verse 29. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land which the Egyptians are saying to do, were drowned. So another example of Moses' faith, but not just his faith, the Israelites as well, is that they were able to pass through the Red Sea. You might recall God parted the Red Sea, and they were walking on dry land as they were passing through the Red Sea. So the Egyptians, they attempted, that's what say to do, to do means, a saying to do. That means desiring, attempting. So they tried to do the same thing as well, and guess what? They got drowned, all right? A side lesson, side sermon that you could preach is whenever the devil or the devil's people or you yourself are trying to copycat or mimic or do what God's trying to do, it ain't the real thing, bud. You're going to drown yourself. You're going to kill yourself doing that. Good. All right, so do it God's way. Don't do it your way where it pre pretends to be God's way. Okay? Anyway, that's a side sermon. Okay? Verse 30. <coughs> so notice these demonstrations of faith that Moses had. He was able to do. Then we see Joshua and the Jews with, with the walls of Jericho. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. So the city of Jericho, the walls of Jericho were surrounded. That's what compassed means. It's like a compass, right? See, being encircled, surrounded. Surrounded seven days, they marched around the walls of Jericho, and by faith they believed that God would conquer it by just marching and by just giving a shout. That takes a lot of faith to do that. And guess what? God honored their faith, and then the walls of Jericho crumbled. You know that story. Verse 31, By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not. So notice right here that Rahab, who is a sinful woman, she's a harlot, a prostitute, the Lord was able to spare her life. The Lord was able to save her. Why? So notice that no matter how wicked her past is, God can bless an act of faith from a wicked sinner. Why? Because she, was, she decided not to be with those who believed not. The unbelievers. She decided, I'm going to join the believers. By just simply doing that, what happened is she was able to receive the spies with peace. In other words, if you know the story, <coughs> there were two spies sent out from the Israelites who were trying to spy out the land uh, of Canaan and Jericho. And then uh, Rahab, she hid the spies. She received them uh, into our house, no hostility, but rather peacefully. And she protected them from the people of Jericho. She hid them, and then the spies were able, you know the story, leave Jericho in peace. So that's the idea. Now, uh, the other case where this incident is me mentioned with Rahab, a second mention you're going to find out is from James himself. He mentions it. So there are two mentions that I could find in the Bible. And one is Hebrews, the other one is James. Go to James 2. James chapter 2. This demonstrates once more how, remember, this is the book of Hebrews, correct? And the book of Hebrews is being addressed to Jews. Now, with the saints in the Old Testament who lived their lives by faith, we've seen how their works came out of their faith, correct? So there is a faith and works system. So Old Testament salvation is different from New Testament Christian salvation. Because remember, look at this. This book is addressed to Hebrews. Remember that again? So this is Jewish. Now go to James chapter 2. <coughs> That's why James does the same thing in James 2.25. Notice he argues... Salvation by works and faith, not faith alone. James 2.25. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. So notice right here James called it works and then the author of Hebrews called it an act of faith. See that? So we see right here works and faith. 
Why would James say that? Well, because he's addressing to Jews like Hebrews. Go to James 1 and verse 1. James 1, 1. Uh, most of you already know that verse. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. See that? So he's speaking to Jews. All right, go back to Hebrews. Go back to Hebrews. Now, remember the book of Hebrews and James, as well as uh, the other general epistles, I've taught to you before that these books are addressed to the tribulation time period. These are for Jews undergoing the tribulation. So because of that, you will see doctrinal application here to tribulation Jews where their salvation is different from us. Now, you might say, why is that? The simple answer is obvious is because of the mark of the beast. That's just one answer, but there are many answers. One of them, which is the simplest, is the mark of the beast. You cannot deny the name of the Lord, and you cannot take the mark of the beast in your right hand or forehead. If you reject the mark of the beast, guess what? You're starving yourself to death. So that's the thing right there. You think the Christians who went through persecution for the past 2,000 years was bad? Wait till the Antichrist and all of hell itself unleashes. Yeah. Now, if, if you think enduring torture during the time that the Christians endured is a lot of work and effort where you don't deny Jesus Christ, I mean, that's the greatest work that you can think of. That's a lot of hard work. Don't tell me that's just easy faith believing in Jesus Christ. No, when someone's torturing your body, man, I mean, that's going to be a lot of work on your part. That's a lot of strong faith that you have to put a lot of work out of it. See, so the tribulation saying it makes so much sense that they're going to naturally go through the same thing as they undergo persecution from the Antichrist. So that's why it makes so much sense that the general epistles that relates to Jewish doctrine and tribulation end time period, it makes so much sense why they would have a faith and work salvation system here. But whereas when you go to Paul's writings, uh, which is referring to his 12 epistles, all right, Paul's 12 epistles from Romans through Philemon, you'll notice it's addressed to the church, to Christians. And that's why he's so emphatic about salvation by faith, not by works. Why? Because that salvation is much different, obviously. The Christians are not undergoing the tribulation from the Antichrist that time. See, so it's much different. Whereas it makes sense that Jews during the tribulation, because they're going through the persecution of the Antichrist, they have to have works for their salvation with their faith. This is why it makes so much sense that Christians who undergo the church age for 2,000 years, they get raptured before the tribulation. That's why their salvation can be faith, not by works. But those who undergo the tribulation, those who are stuck through the tribulation, they, don't, they can't have the same salvation as Christians, which is why they're going to have works with their faith. That's why there is that pre-trib rapture. See, it divides it. It makes so much more sense, the verses that you're reading. So this is called dispensationalism, or more accurately, dispensational salvation, for some of you who didn't know. Okay, but anyway, uh, now that we understand that's the doctrinal layout in Hebrews, let's go back to Hebrews again. <coughs> Hebrews again. And then verse 32, Hebrews eleven thirty-two. And what shall I more say? So the author is saying, what more can he say? For the time would fail to tell me of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel and of the prophets. So this is pretty self-explanatory. Time would fail for the author to tell. Time would fail for me to tell you of all, of, uh, excuse me, <coughs> all other heroes of faith. And then he gives these answers like uh, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samson, uh, as Samuel, excuse me, and then uh, of the other prophets. Now, Dr. Uppman, uh, he gives all the details over here. So I'd like to read you his commentary. This is the Hebrews commentary from Dr. Peter S. Ruckman. I want to read to you all these other heroes of faith. So the author, he doesn't have time, but obviously we can guess the names 
or the Old Testament characters as he undergoes through all of this. We can also guess the acts of faith that these Old Testament saints had. So you might wonder, what were the acts of faith from these names like Gideon and then Barak and Samson and etc. So uh, what you're going to find out is notice with these heroes of faith, these don't, act, these don't appear to be heroes of faith. Just read their stories. Gideon, you think he's a man of faith? Do you saw that, did you read about his story of cowardice? Oh, Lord, you know, uh, please, you know, show me a sign. Oh, Lord, I can't do this. Oh, I'm so scared. And he ain't a man of faith. He's a man of doubt. But God considered him a man of faith. Why? <clears throat> he chose to believe in God in spite of the cowardice. Remember the same thing with Isaac. In spite of the doubt that he went through, he chose to believe. Remember that one? Same thing with Moses with his failure with God when he feared the king. Remember that? But he chose to believe and then to endure the wrath of the king. See, what makes the ultimate difference, like I told you, to encourage yourself being a hero of faith is, one, you're in the same boat as these guys. They all failed like you did in their faith. But they made a choice to believe. That's the ultimate difference, Amen. like you. Even though you complain, you whine, you doubt, and yeah, you're a coward, and sometimes you get bitter and mad at God unjustly, right. all right? And you shouldn't. Right. But nevertheless, like I told you, you made a choice, even though you're going, oh, yeah, you know, and then you were whining and groaning, complaining. You chose to keep pressing forward, chose to endure. You chose to believe anyways. That's the important thing. Uh, here's another one. Barak, you know his story? That guy's a coward. He didn't want to fight. Uh, he didn't want to fight those uh, chariots of iron. Sisera, General Sisera. So he asked a woman for help. I'm not going unless you're going. Some general, some soldier of the cross. Sounds like some husbands, right? I ain't going unless, what, your wife goes to church? Yeah, it's, a lot of you are laughing, but you know that's true. Yeah, you know that's true in the church. That's a shame. So, uh, but Barak, what? He chose to believe that I can conquer these chariots of iron. He went out anyway. Uh, Samson. Samson, really? Yeah. A hero of faith? He kept going after prostitutes. He kept disobeying God. He violated the Nazarite vow backwards and forwards. Like, if there was a person who deserved hell, it was Samson. But God considered him a saved individual and a hero of faith. Isn't that amazing? That's something. Another one, Jephthah. Jephthah, did you read his, sto uh, his story of cowardice as well? Uh, if you look at Jephthah's life, he made a foolish vow to the Lord. Uh, Lord, whatever first comes out of the gate, I will offer that thing as a sacrifice to you. He didn't think it would be one of his daughters. That was a foolish thing, but God considered him a hero of faith. Why? He and Samson chose to believe in God that they can conquer their enemies. And that's what you're going to notice sometimes here and there. See, that's the key difference. Of David also. So David messed up with murder and adultery, but notice that his act of faith, God honored. You, you recall, he conquered Goliath. He conquered his enemies. Samuel. Uh, really, Samuel feared Saul, if you read that. So that ain't faith, that's fear. But Samuel, God ignores his fearful moment and looks at his acts of faith. He was a faithful judge that whole time. He helped the Jews conquer the Philistines and <clears throat> helped them with many things. And of the prophets, you read the lives of these prophets, I mean, they had a life full of faith. And we see so many incidents from these prophets in verse 33, how they enacted their faith. Who through faith subdued kingdoms. So we see examples of prophets where they were able to conquer, control kingdoms and empires. Uh, Dr. Uckman says right here, so I'll start reading page 340. The reader will find the victories described throughout Joshua, Judges 1st and 2nd Samuel, 
and first and second kings, namely the victories of Joshua, Barak, Gideon, David, Joab, Jephthah, Caleb, Uzziah, Joash, Jehoshaphat, and Rehoboam. Also the next part of verse 33, it says right here, wrought righteousness. Dr. Upman says the cases are too many to list. So here are the people who performed acts of righteousness. They chose to live righteously rather than wrongly. It applies to all of the prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, plus characters like Micaiah, 1 Kings 22, Elijah, Jehoiada, 2 Kings 11 through 12, Solomon at 1 Kings 1 through 3, and Abigail, 1 Samuel 25. So uh, through faith, they chose to do what is right rather than wrong, even if they were going to suffer for it, see? Even if the temptation in the world is against them. Next part of verse 33, obtain promises. So that's self-explanatory. Dr. Upman says right here, again, there are too many to list. Anyone from Jabez who obtained one of the simplest answers to prayer found anywhere in the Bible, 1 Chronicles 4. To Caleb who received a whole mountain, Joshua 14. The promise getters are found by the hundred. Among them are Abigail, who saves the lives of several dozen people. Joshua, who lives to see Joshua 1, 6 fulfilled to the letter. David, who lives to see 2 Samuel 7, 12 fulfilled to the letter. The wilderness believers who entered into Canaan to see Deuteronomy 4 through 20 fulfilled before their eyes. Jeroboam, who experienced the most unlikely type of fulfillment of a promise, 1 Kings 11, 31 through 38. And Joseph, who asked for a promise about the treatment of his bones after he was dead. That's Exodus 13, 19. Next part of verse 33. Stop the mouths of lions. All right. So they had such faith that the lion's mouth would be closed. that They would be stopped. Dr. Rutman writes over here, which is pretty obvious. We know is, one is Daniel, but it doesn't necessarily uh, restrict to Daniel. Dr. Upman writes right here, sometimes with knowledge, Paul in 2 Timothy 4. Sometimes without the knowledge, 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 24 and 28. Some Jews were sent back to Samaria to stop lions from eating a half-breed population as 2 Kings 17. So there are examples of acts of faith. All right, verse 34, quench the violence of fire. <coughs> in other words, they were able to stop the fire from becoming so violent. So violent is actually like an act of killing or harming them. So in other words, they're able to stop the fire from harming them. And the, my, uh, what comes to mind, obviously, is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were tossed in the fiery furnace. Uh, the next part reads, escape the edge of the sword. So they were able to escape uh, basically, that's a metaphorical expression by the edge of the sword, the blade from uh, cutting them, from killing them. So David did at least a dozen occasions in 1 Samuel, chapter 22 through 24 and chapter 26. As the two spies did at Joshua 2, as Abiathar did as 1 Kings 2.26, as Peter did at Acts chapter 12, verse 1 through 19. And Dr. Altman's ride, uh, writes, and so forth and so on. You can find a lot more. Another one in verse 34 is, out of weakness were made strong. In other words, Dr. Altman writes, physically, as uh, Samson, Joshua, Benaiah, Benaiah, the three mighties of David, and Hezekiah, Isaiah 38 through 39, meaning that these were just weak, mere human beings, but even with such a weakness of frame, they became strong. They became mighty. Samson was just a human, but he became Superman and just conquered thousands of Philistines. Joshua and his army were just a small minority, but they were able to, by the mere shout, conquer the walls of Jericho, uh, etc. Spiritually, as Judah, Aaron, and Samuel. In other words, uh, spiritually speaking, they were very weak. Now, that's encouraging to you. You feel spiritually weak, don't you? You read Judah's life? That's a weak individual right there. I mean, you read about the incident, what he did with his daughter-in-law, right? And stuff like that. But then uh, he had faith where he was able to say she was more righteous than I. So God took that as an act of faith. 
So out of weakness, we're made strong. God has put you in weak situations many times, right? You feel spiritually weak, but such irony. Out of that spiritual weakness, strength came out, didn't it? See, so that's a great example. Uh, verse 34 continues reading, Waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. So in other words, they were able to increase, that's what wax means, to increase their courage, their strength as they were fighting in battle. They were able to have the armies, their foreign armies, that's the armies of the aliens. They were to able to chase away the foreign armies, that's to flight the armies of the aliens. We see this is exactly described in 1 Chronicles, and those involved are listed in 2 Samuel. Uh, the next part, verse 35, women received their dead raised to life again. Dr. Altman writes, as in the two cases found in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 21, and 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 35. The reader will observe how the writer is approaching New Testament times, for the widow of Nain's son goes through this, and their dead could be applied to Mary and Martha in their relationship to Lazarus. So we see these biblical characters as an example. Uh, the verse reads, uh, excuse me. Uh, let me continue. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. In other words, people weren't raised to life again. The other side. There were people who died. <coughs> they did not receive saving deliverance from their enemies. They instead suffered and were tortured by the hands of their enemies. But they had such faith in God that they, in spite of such bloody persecution, they went through it. <coughs> the, Dr. Upton says, the writer moves up further. And then he mentions during the Old Testament time, during the transition, we see cases of Old Testament prophets who were actually tortured. Old Testament saints who were tortured by their enemies. And then you could probably guess during that time period, the New Testament, when the early church was coming out, they were being tortured as well. <clears throat> excuse me. Notice, uh, <coughs> oh, excuse me, my throat is really dry here. Uh, continue reading onwards. It says right here um, that they might obtain a better resurrection. So they could care less about their current body. See, if it was battered and tortured because they preferred that they're, they're going to have a better body after that, a better resurrection. And this better body, better resurrection is, see, back over here, keep your eye on the prize. The real reward is in heaven. So they preferred that. So they could care less if their body was battered or tortured. But even more so than that, uh, what is even uh, more encouraging, if you keep reading about this torture, look at verse 36, 37. You talk about Fox's Book of Martyrs. That's a book that everyone should read. I did a whole sermon just on that. That was just something else. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. So other people, they went through trials, of, they went through sufferings where people mocked them cruelly and then they were whipping them. That's what scourging is. Yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. So in other words, he's saying truly, that's what yea is. It's like for certainty. That's an interjection word that's trying to establish that. They, in addition, went through jail time, prison time. That's the idea. Chains, that's what bonds is referring to. They were stoned. So that's self-explanatory. They were sawn asunder. That is self-explanatory. How self-explanatory? Literally sawed in half. That's what sawn, asunder means. Asunder means to divide in half. Uh, some Jews teach that that was the prophet Isaiah. So the prophet Isaiah uh, supposedly uh, was inside a log, and then they sawed that prophet in half inside that log, actually. So that could be referring to Isaiah, actually, around that time. Were tempted. So they were tempted. And if you read about these martyrs' story, deny Jesus Christ. If you do, we'll give you this. 
We'll give you this reward. We'll give you this pleasure. Just only deny Jesus Christ. But they didn't. We're slain with the sword. So that's pretty obvious. They, the sword killed them. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. So here are these believers who wandered in the wilderness, who didn't have a permanent home, trying to run away from uh, getting caught by the government who was going to torture them, kill them. This could also refer to prophets who had no place to sleep and that they were persecuted by their fellow Jewish people. That could be referring to the apostles themselves or those missionaries because they had no permanent home and they would just wander around. And then they probably wore sheepskins and goatskins, kind of like John the Baptist, kind of like Elijah. And th throughout that time, they were destitute and they were afflicted and they were tormented. Last part, I like this. This is what I want to get to. Of whom the world was not worthy. So in other words, get this now. So all these people who went through such bloody torture and persecution, the Bible says the, the reason why is the world was not worthy for them. In other word, words, the world was not worth it to them, which is why they're going through all these bloody problems. Uh, who'd want that? What does that mean? That's why verse 38 continues. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. So here they are, here they are wandering about where they don't have a permanent place to dwell, whether it means literally, like I demonstrated before, given examples before, or metaphorically speaking, where to a Christian, this world is not our home. It's not our permanent home. So here we are traveling, wandering around, and then in deserts and up in the mountains, and here we are inside the dens and caves of the earth. And why? Why does this all have to happen to us? Bloody torture, wandering around, no home, no roof over our heads, because the world is not worthy to you. That's what God said. How does that make any sense? How does that make any sense? Why would God do something like that? Hey, uh, you know, settling down, having a, a comfortable lifestyle with family, good job, good pay, having every worldly ambition and pleasure fulfilled. God says, <coughs> ain't worth it to you. You should go through suffering instead. You should be sawn asunder. You should be tortured. You should uh, be homeless. Why? Because the world ain't worth it to you. Does that make any sense? No, it don't make sense. Let's be honest. It don't make sense. Yet, how is this encouraging? Well, the thing is, you have to look at God's point of view, not man's point of view. See, the idea is this, is that um, if you were to picture a cup of water, okay? A cup of water is pure, right? And everybody wants to drink pure water. Pure water means it must not be contaminated. It must be pure. That's good drinking water. That's something, that's basically, see this? It's worthy, so to speak, right? It's good quality. It's worthy quality. To keep it pure, you need to keep it pure. But think about it. I don't care how big this pure cup of water is. You can give me a whole gallon full, but if I see a little doo-doo right here, I, I ain't drinking out of that. I don't care. There's no compromising here. No, I, there's no negotiation here that I am going to drink that cup of water. It ain't pure to me. It's contaminated. It's already filthy. Now, how many Christians you see compromising just a little bit of doo-doo? Yeah, of a piece of dung? Yeah. It's just a, little, just a little bit. Hey, aren't you, aren't you more worthy than that? Look, you're not a piece of doo-doo, all right? You're pure. You're a holy child of God. God sees you as worthy quality. 
See that? When that doo-doo touches you, man, you're contaminated. It don't go together. So what happens? If the water is going to fight for its purity and that doo-doo is just going to keep fighting it with its corruption, what's going to happen? The water has to suffer. The water has to suffer because of such contradiction. When there is a contradiction right here of the world where it collides with the say believer who is walking worthy of the Lord, guess what? The world won't leave you alone or put up with it. It has to, it has to build up a contradiction. There must be a fight, a tension, a suffering, so to speak, that must happen. Why? Because you're worthy quality. Worthy quality has to suffer when that piece of garbage right there contaminates you. But if you settle down with the world, see that? Then it ends the contradiction for you, doesn't it? So instead of maintaining and fighting for your purity, you decide to blend in. And everything's all right, isn't it? Because you're not suffering. But if you're going to fight for your purity, guess what? That thing stinks to high heaven. And if you're going to fight for your purity, fight for your purity, guess what's going to happen? You're going to suffer as it fights it. As it fights it, it's suffering. Why? Because once that poop collides with purity, there is a contradiction of elements going on and something must suffer. That's why you're suffering. See that? That's why you go through torture. That's why you go through cruel mocking, scourgings, and stuff like that. We're too easy to blame God. It's not because of God. It's because that's how wicked the world is. Do you understand that? That's how corrupt, contaminating the world is. So because of that, if you're going to maintain your purity, you wonder why you're suffering so much living in the San Francisco Bay Area, planning a church and coming to church. You wonder why, missionary, you're suffering so much in the mission field. You, you wonder why underground Christians are suffering so much in communist and uh, such horrible countries of persecution. Why? Because that's how wicked, contaminated the place is. It's full of doo-doo everywhere. More doo-doo, the more you'll have to purify, right? And the more suffering. See, that's the reason why. Now you understand why you suffer, why God says the world is not worthy of you. That's why you're suffering. You know why? Because he sees you as that much worthy. He sees you as that much. You're too pure for this. You're too pure for this. I don't want you contaminated. So then fight for your purity. And then that's why suffering results. So uh, it makes a lot of sense. When you go through uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. Now this makes sense, right? And we'll close it off here for the night. Thank you. Hope you received a blessing. You learned something. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. You see why it's purified here through the fire of suffering? 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 6, verse 6, wherein he greatly rejoiced, though now for a season. See that? It's only temporary, right? The suffering. It uh, confirms what I argued earlier. If need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more, what? Precious than of gold that perisheth. You know what God sees you? Not pure, but even more pure than the purest gold. Though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. See, it's to purify you. Suffering is there because it's a purification process. You might say, well, I don't like suffering. Then what are you going to do? Huh? If, th look, people don't use their heads, right? You pretend, all right? I know I'm ending here, but I, I got to preach a little bit here, okay? 
You oh. think, right, this is your problem, okay? Your problem is, well, can I stay pure and avoid suffering when that doo-doo is all around our world? No, in this cup of water, there's no such thing. You know what this cup is? This cup is called world, okay? In this world, there's no such thing as, let's have a half section right here of something pure and a half section here of something dirty. No such thing. Then we all live like Amish people. Live on our own little island, having summer camp every seven days a week. That would be wonderful. But that ain't it. We're not kingdom builders, okay? Even though Christians are trying to do that with politics in America. No such thing. We're not kingdom builders. You know what we are? We live in that junk. So as we live in that junk, that water is suffering that contamination and must fight for its purity. That's why suffering is, let me write this one word, all right? We don't get it. I don't get it, so I need to write it, okay? Because I don't get it, all right? Inevitable. Get that through your head. Inevitable. Oh, no one likes that. You didn't like that just now, right? Nobody likes that. Why? Because all we're thinking about is the world, how, you know, I'm building up a family, home, saving up money, getting comfortable in the world, and you got your mind at the wrong place. You think you can do that while maintaining your purity? Impossible. Especially in, if, if you live in a place that's full of garbage, all right? You all signed up for this, see? So because of that, that's the reason why you're going to suffer. But if you don't want to suffer, that's fine, all right? Then let it have its way with you. And you're not worthy. Look, you're, uh, you're, too worthy, you're too worthy for it. The world is not worthy for you. You're more worthy than the world. So don't give in to the world, okay? It ain't worth it, okay? You're more worth it than the world to, in God's eyes. So keep yourself pure, keep yourself clean, even if you have to suffer for it. That's a lesson that must be learned. Why? Because don't forget the three tips here, right? What Moses, why he was able to choose suffering, right? So keep, keep your eyes on this. Then we'll understand. All right. Uh, I thought we'd finish chapter 11. We didn't. Okay, last verse it will be next time. And then also we're going to combine it with chapter 12. Lots of good stuff at chapter 12. But we learned a lot from our heroes of faith. Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching was eye-opening to us and that we've taken your word seriously. No one likes suffering, Father, but it is inevitable as we maintain our purity. Help us to realize that and not live in fantasy land that, oh, there's such a place where I can live happily ever after and maintain purity while the world gets more wicked and wicked. No such thing, Lord. We live in the wicked world. So it must collide. And then purity to be fought for and maintained, it'll have to suffer, it'll have to struggle for it. So I pray, Heavenly Father, that we'll understand this real truth, this honest truth, but, uh, but understand and be encouraged as well that this is only temporary, Father. That it's not forever. And as we undergo through the fire of trial and go through this cycle of faith, tribulation, experience, patience, it only gets better and better, Lord. And help us to realize that in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.